Okay, so let's talk about the photoelectric effect. As the name implies, well, photo means light and electric, electricity. And so the photoelectric effect is when you shine light onto certain metals, the metals produce electricity. This was discovered in 1887 by Heinrich Hertz. And part of it was reasonably predicted by classical physics, and most of it was not. And it was pretty confusing, and in fact, it remained confusing. It got more confusing when J.J. Thompson discovered the electron in 1897. You would think that discovering what electricity actually is would make an electrical effect, effect less confusing, but it was the other way around. It made it even more confusing. So this is Hertz's experimental setup. What you have is a glass tube where all the air has been sucked out of it. There's a metal plate on one side that you shine light onto. It's hooked up to a circuit, but there's this giant gap in between. When you shine the light, electrons get kicked off, fly over to the other side, and complete the circuit. So as long as light is shining, it runs, and when it doesn't, it doesn't. Furthermore, he had the ability to stop those electrons from happening. He essentially had an adjustable battery hooked up the other way around. So the electrons would fly across, and let's keep in mind what voltage is. It's kinetic energy per charge. So the voltage is an indirect measurement of the kinetic energy of the electrons. So if the electrons have enough kinetic energy, they could fight their way through and hit. But if he turned up the voltage, eventually they'd shoot out and they'd stop and they'd turn back around again. And so we call that the stopping potential. So he could measure frequency of light hitting, intensity of light hitting, how bright or dark it is, as well as the stopping potential, which was a measure of the kinetic energy of the electrons. So let's talk about what they got right. Classic physics accurately predicted that if you shine brighter light on the metal, you will get more electricity. And to be specific, when you shine a brighter light on the metal, you get more electrical current. That worked. It was an accurate prediction. All good. Unfortunately, there were four things that did not work that classical physics could not explain. And it took some real doing to get those nailed down. So what were they? The first thing is that certain colors of light worked and other colors didn't. Specifically, as you Roy G. Biv up the rainbow, red might not work, orange doesn't work, but then yellow does, or maybe yellow doesn't, but green does, uh, blue does, but the rest of them don't. In fact, for a lot of metals, it's ultraviolet light that works rather than anything we can see. But you have to go up the electromagnetic spectrum to get light that actually works. Extremely bright red light could have no effect but very dim blue light would still have some effect, and that was very strange. Second, the stopping potential did not increase when you used brighter light. That means that the electrons are not getting more kinetic energy. The voltage, the kinetic energy per charge, doesn't go up when you use brighter light. Third, what did cause the voltage to go up, the kinetic energy per charge to go up? The color bluer light made a greater stopping potential, and there was no explanation for that either. And finally, it happened instantaneously, even with really dim light, if it happened at all. So you find a frequency of light that works, and you shine dim light on it, and the expectation is, okay, so you've got these electrons that are jiggling around on the surface of the metal, and if you give them energy, then they're going to jiggle harder and harder and harder and harder, and eventually some of them will start to escape, right? And that should happen faster if you use brighter light, and it should happen slower if you use dimmer light. But that's not what happened. It either happened instantaneously or not at all. None of these things could be explained with classical physics. And it took 18 years. It took from 1887 to 1905 and a man named Albert Einstein to actually figure this one out. And it's the paper for which he won the Nobel Prize. So how did he do it? Einstein based his explanation on the work of Max Planck. Planck's E equals HF was the key to break open the idea of the photoelectric effect. Planck said, I'm going to make energy chunky because that's what I have to do to get the math to work. Einstein said, 
Hmm. Do you know why you have to do that? Because light is chunky. Light comes in little packets, little bundles that Einstein called quanta. Any fundamental packet of something, a quantum it just means amount in Latin. So a quanta is just a single quantum. And for light, Einstein called that the photon. He said light is not acting as a wave, it's acting as a particle, which, what? Right? Waves, particles, they're different things, right? Light diffracts, light interferes. That's proof that it's a wave, right? Einstein said, well, sometimes. I have a stupid analogy for you. Imagine you've got a floor that is completely covered in Velcro. And on that floor, you have a bunch of soccer balls that are also covered in the other type of Velcro. So all the soccer balls are stuck to the floor. Now, imagine you come over and you give a soccer ball a kick. If you don't kick it hard enough, you won't even break the Velcro bond and the ball won't go anywhere, right? Okay, well, if you kick it hard enough, then the ball will fly away with some kinetic energy, right? How much energy is it going to have? It's going to have the energy of the kick minus however much work was necessary to separate it from the Velcro. Yes? That should make good sense. All right, so let's talk light and electrons. The key that Einstein figured out is that light as a particle, individual photons hit individual electrons on the surface of the metal and cause them to kick away. It's a one-to-one -one thing. So when you shine dim light, that's like having only a few people coming in and giving balls a kick. Bright light means a whole lot of people coming in to kick those soccer balls. And so brighter light means more photons. But bluer light means higher energy photons. This is Planck's E equals HF. Blue light has a higher frequency. So that's a bigger kick. So super dim light, one photon coming in and hitting. If it's blue or ultraviolet or whatever, it can have enough energy to kick the electron off. And so you can get an effect because the light is very dim. There's lo very low total energy, but the energy of that photon is high enough to give that kick. And that is the key. Individual photons hit individual electrons and cause them to come off. The more energy the photons have, the more energy the electrons end up with. If the photons don't have enough energy to actually remove the electron from the metal, then nothing happens. This idea explains every single unexplainable, previously unexplainable part of the photoelectric effect. The math on this is actually shockingly easy. Once Einstein realized that it was individual particles doing work to give kinetic energy to individual electrons, all he had to do was apply the work energy theorem. So you know what that is. Initial energy plus or minus work equals final energy, right? Okay, so what is our initial energy? It's the energy of the photon coming in. Planck tells us that's HF. What is the work? The work is what's necessary to tear it off the metal. Einstein called it the work function, and we represent it by the Greek letter phi. What is the final energy? The final energy is the kinetic energy of the electron that is flying away from the surface of the metal. And so here it is. That's it. Ke max equals hf minus phi. And if you graph that function, you'll see that kinetic energy versus frequency gives you a straight line. And this graph has a couple of cool features. First, the slope of the graph, well, if y equals mx plus b, then m, the slope, has to be Planck's constant. That's pretty cool. The y-intercept, if you look, is a negative number. That's your work function. That's how much work is necessary to pull it off. And the x-intercept is the threshold frequency. It's the minimum frequency to get it to work at all. That's going to be different for different metals. If you have zinc or gold or copper, each one has a different work function. And that was a strange thing that people didn't realize either. And so that's it. That's the entirety of the photoelectric effect. It's a linear conservation of energy, work energy theorem problem that once you realize it is very simple. And Einstein won himself a Nobel Prize for that. I think it's almost hard to overstate the impact that the photoelectric effect has had 
uh, both on science and on society. In science, this idea of particle wave duality is mind-blowing, and it opens the door to a lot of interesting and strange things that we're going to talk about next. But it also created a whole ton of technology that we previously didn't have, like photovoltaic cells for power generation, like uh, photodiodes are the things that automatically turn lights on and off when it gets dark or dim. We use the photoelectric effect in CDs and DVDs. It's everywhere. We use it in light curtains for uh, anything from industrial safety to a garage door. So if you break the beam, the laser that's going through doesn't make it to the other side, doesn't cause current to flow, and then you can automatically shut off a garage door or turn off a factory floor or something like that. The photoelectric effect is everywhere in modern technology. And back to that particle wave duality for just a second. If light particles are kicking electrons and causing them to fly away, that means that they're transferring momentum? Can a massless particle transfer momentum? Isn't momentum just mass times velocity, so no mass means no momentum? Well, we're going to jump ahead to the Compton effect in the next video. And the Compton effect happened in 1927, significantly later. We're going to talk about the Compton effect and something called de Broglie wavelengths. And then after that, we'll back up and we'll talk about the Bohr model of the atom and how all of this stuff ties together.